بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد حبت في الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته as we're continuing on in our study of Balugh Amaram and we are in the Book of Marriage and we've reached the Bab of Rida or the chapter of breastfeeding uh, a child uh, breastfeeding a child or children other than a woman's uh, a woman's child by birth. And in this chapter, Bab al Rida, this chapter discusses some of the rulings and details gained from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with regards to al Rida or regarding, regarding breastfeeding. So this group of ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam deals with this particular and very, uh, this specific and very important topic. Uh, with regards to rida'ah, uh, some of the things which happen with regards to rida'ah, meaning if a woman uh, breastfeeds uh, a child which is not hers and it is a complete breastfeeding which is uh, one in which is considered by the shara and we'll talk about those details as we get into these ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but however with regards to the hukum of the rida is that it makes uh, several things or four things in uh, specifically uh, lawful which are similar to the uh, relationship or rulings that uh, a person has or a male relative has with their female meaning uh, the the mother and her child her male child or the mother and her father, or uh, others who are can be the mahrim of the woman, that uh, rida'a also makes lawful what is lawful uh, for them. And this is in four matters. First, is that if a woman suckles a child, which is not hers, and it is a complete suckling, meaning as is mentioned in one of the ahadith that we'll uh, cover, uh, that it is five times, okay? And if she suckles a child five times, then that child becomes unlawful. It makes tahrim nikah, meaning that she can never marry that child. And that child becomes like her her child, it's a child of rida'a, okay, of suckling, a breastfed child. And the second thing in which it establishes, uh, as far as the bond, is it also establishes that the child, this male child now that's been suckled by the woman, uh, can now view uh, this woman without hijab. So. Ibahat another, as well as khalwa, as well as being alone with her. Because now she is taking the station as if she is the mother of this child. So it is as if you were with your mother. And of course, one point being, as Bin Uthaymeen mentions, that of course the relationship by nasab or the actual lineage, the blood relations, is stronger than rida'a, of course. But however, rida'a makes these things, uh, certain things, it has certain rulings, and it makes certain things mubah, or lawful. The third thing that rada'a, this suckling, does, is it makes that male child 
able to be the muhrim or the the uh, uh, the the mahram the mahram for the uh, woman, meaning that if she has no guardian, so it establishes guardianship. That if uh, it comes to a point, not only he can saf travel with her, and but he can also, if for some reason her father's not living or no one else uh, who is in the position to give her away in marriage, he can be the guardian. It establishes him uh, as a guardian. And the fourth uh, thing which is established is ibaha to sefer, meaning that uh, he can travel with her uh, as, a, as a guardian, that the woman, as we know, uh, from a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, which means that a woman who believes in Allah in the last day should not travel uh, a night in a day illa bil illa bi dhul uh, mahram or kama qala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that a woman should not travel without a guardian that she should have a Guardian. So this guardianship, one of the ways this guardianship is established is through rida'a, is through this uh, suckling, this breastfeeding. Moving on to the first hadith in this chapter. This is the 964th hadith in my, uh, in my copy. Narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, One or two sucks do not make marriage unlawful. Uh, and Muslim reported this. In this hadith in Sahih Muslim, an authentic hadith, uh, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, it shows us uh, that a... Uh, that the suckling baby's act of sucking on a woman's uh, breast or drinking her milk once or twice does not confirm and prove tahrim, the prohibition, as we mentioned. The pro and here the prohibition is referring to uh, the prohibition of nikah. So it must be, uh, this hadith illustrates for us, that it must be more than that. However, it does not distinctly specify, and we gain those details from other ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A hadith narrated by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha clearly states that in order to prove such a prohibition, a woman has to breastfeed a baby at least five times. So what we learn from this hadith is that two times, once or twice, is not sufficient. This hadith illustrates for us that once or twice uh, is not uh, uh, sufficient. And uh, another benefit that we gain from this hadith is this hadith shows us that uh, rida'a is uh, has a hukum shari attached to it, meaning it has a sharia ruling attached to breastfeeding. And so those rulings must be uh, observed. And that's one of the things we gain from this hadith because that's the reason Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that uh, la tuharimu la tuhar uh, la tuharimu al masahatu wal masa wa masatan that she said that one or two uh, drinks or sucklings do not make uh, uh, a woman unlawful meaning unlawful in marriage and this is of course pertaining to the breastfeeding woman with the child which is not hers, that it is not established uh, this um, tahrim or prohibition of nikah is not established by one or two sucklings, according to the statement of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Another benefit we gain from this hadith is that what we understand from the actual statement of Aisha anha, is that in, in this hadith is that anything less than three sucklings does not make 
did not establish that prohibition, that prohibition of nikah between the suckling and the, the woman who breastfeeds. So that's what we understand from this hadith as far as the uh, mafhum, the mafhum or the understanding of this hadith. However, as we mentioned in another hadith that we will cover, uh, we learn that uh, that the uh, suckling must be five times in order for it to uh, make it, you know, establish that tahrim, that hukum. Uh, in the next hadith, the 965th hadith, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Be sure, you women, uh, be sure uh, who your brothers are. For suckling is that which is the result of hunger, when milk is the child's only food, mutafakun alayhi. Uh, this, uh, as far as the context of this hadith, it happened that a certain person was sitting by Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha while the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came. He, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, did not like the idea of someone sitting with her in seclusion. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha informed the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam that the person was her foster brother in the sense that both of them were breastfed by the same woman in their infancy. Upon hearing this, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam observed a general instruction to the effect that one should thoroughly investigate and confirm the validity of such a statement in relation to one's breastfed brothers. Uh, this is only because uh, breastfeeding in one's infancy when the child has no other source of food except the breast milk uh, proves this prohibition. This was a special instruction applicable to such a case only excluding others. So this hadith uh, illustrates for us the ruling, uh, a, well, it illustrates, in fact, uh, several important benefits. Some of those uh, benefits that we gain from this hadith uh, <clears throat> is, uh, first, that it is uh, an obligation to uh, strive to be safe or take the safest route with regards to issues of khalwa or being alone with a woman and other than that, from the other uh, issues uh, in which the origin of them is Muharram. So, for example, a khalwa, being alone with a woman, we know Islamically that this is impermissible unless, of course, it is a woman who is uh, uh, your wife or your sister or your aunts or your mother, your grandmother, and so on and so forth. That it's impermissible. So uh, that uh, so except for those those exceptions, the asal is is that it's uh, muharram that it's impermissible to sit with uh, a woman alone in seclusion, uh, and so this hadith illustrates for us that we should take caution and be careful with regards to those uh, types of situations. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the uh, the way the vigilance of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in protecting his household and the women of his household that he Alayhi Salatu Wasallam was concerned when he came in and Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was alone with with uh, this male individual Alayhi Salatu Wasallam so he had a jealousy Alayhi Salatu Wasallam uh, which was the proper Islamic jealousy that a, a man should be concerned about his household and about uh, and and have this natural this innate uh, jealousy which establishes his manhood and which is also something which is uh, beautified and uh, recommended or an obligation in fact in the shar. So this hadith illustrates for us that a very important uh, aspect and manner and that the Prophet وسلم, was very vigilant in protecting and preserving his family and his and their honor. Another benefit of this hadith is it shows us also that it is an obligation upon us to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in this matter and all matters of his salawatu rabbi wa salamu alayhi 
and that uh, with regard to our family, that we should also, because we're responsible for them, as the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, everyone uh, is uh, responsible and uh, responsible for his flock or responsible for those charged who he's charged an authority over. So uh, it shows us, this hadith illustrates for us, that ra'iyya, that, uh, that responsibility, and that this was the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we should follow that sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and exhibit, uh, take care, uh, take the proper, proper and appropriate responsibility for our families as well as exhibit the healthy and righteous jealousy and concern for them. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also affirms the brotherhood that is established by Rida'a that uh, Aisha radiallahu anha and this other individual had suckled from the same woman when they were children and due to this, this established uh, a, a, a type of uh, uh, a kinship through suckling which was a kinship which is considered that she was actually radiallahu anha allowed to be alone with this man so it establishes this uh, this type of kinship uh, of uh, through suckling, which is other than the blood kinship, of course. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us uh, that the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it uh, explains and details the Quran because from the ayat. Uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al-Kareem wa ummahatukum wa allati arda'nakum uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions your, uh, that your mothers uh, that are established through rida'a that are established through that have given you uh, that have suckled you and we understand the details of this ayah and how this Rida'a, or how this suckling establishes that kinship uh, through this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this is the case uh, with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. In the next hadith, uh, narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, uh, Sahla, the daughter of Suhail radiallahu ta'ala an, came and said, O oh Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Salam, the manumitted slave of Abu Hudayfa, lives with us in our house, and he has attained what men attain, meaning puberty. Uh, he said, Suckle him so you would become unlawful to him in marriage, reported by Muslim. This hadith makes, uh, clarifies for us the hukum regarding suckling someone who is uh, reached the age of puberty, past the age, uh, of course, which is mentioned uh, as, uh, and, and mentioned of two years, that as, as a rida or suckling is of uh, suckling your child, for the woman suckling her child, is uh, two years. So, as far as the duration, and so this hadith gives us, clarifies us for us the hukum or the ruling with regards to suckling a, uh, someone who has reached puberty, who's past that, uh, obviously past the two years. So what we gain from this hadith, uh, specifically some of the benefits of this hadith, is that first, this hadith, uh, it establishes that according to the zahir of this hadith, the apparent meaning of this hadith is that the rida'a or the suckling uh, makes that prohibition uh, for marriage even for someone who is uh, kabir, you know, even lil uh, kibar, meaning someone who is of 
of age, reach the age of puberty or, or, or beyond that. That's what we see from the zahir, from the apparent meaning of this hadith. However, the jamhur, majority of the ulama, uh, say that this hadith was khas or it was specifically uh, for the situation of Salam, the Mola Abi Hudayfa, radiallahu ta'ala. So this hadith, as we see the jamhur, the majority of the ulama, uh, hold the view that that is not the case. That is not what we should, uh, that this hukum, this hukum, which is clear from this hadith, which took place, is uh, uh, restricted and specific, was specific for uh, the mola of uh, Abu Hudayfa, uh, Salam. So, uh, we see that the scholars differ, but as, as I mentioned, that the majority hold that view. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the hars, or the, the hirs of the sahaba, radiyallahu ta'ala'inu uh, in, in learning and, and seeking knowledge, in talib al-ilm. And this was the case with the men and the women, that they would ask the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam questions. They would seek fatwa, they would seek clarification and bayina about issues and about things that happened in their life in order to come closer to Allah and practice Islam better, to please Allah Azza wa Jal. So they had sincerity and they had, they were, they had, um, uh, they strove to seek uh, Islamic knowledge and come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as the Salaf, the early scholars of this Ummah, they used to say, Talib al-ilm, Talib al-jannah, that seeking knowledge is seeking paradise. Meaning that the one who has sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they are seeking knowledge in order to bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order to better practice their Islam, and in order to give da'wah and call people to good. So all of this is uh, for the akhirah, things that will benefit them in the akhirah if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it. So this is talab al-jannah, talab al-ilm, talab al-jannah. It's not talab al-dunya, it's not seeking salaries, it's not seeking positions, but rather true talab al-ilm with sincerity that the one that will be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Talib al-Jannah, is seeking paradise. And this is what the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala majma'in, were upon. Another benefit we gain from this hadith is that this hadith also shows us that the sound of a woman's voice is not aura. It is not her aura. So uh, that a woman can be heard. That doesn't mean a woman should be singing and have a seductive voice or anything like this. No. However, her voice, what we learn from this hadith, is not a part of her aura, not a part of her uh, things which have to be uh, uh, concealed, so to speak. Those are some of the main uh, benefits of that hadith. In the next hadith, Narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah, uh, 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 narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Afla, her foster, uh, her foster suckling uncle, brother of Abdul, uh, uh, Abdul Qais, came and asked her permission to enter after the hijab was instituted for women. She said, I refuse to allow him in, and when Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I told him about what I had done, so he commanded me to give him permission to enter where I am and said, he is your paternal uncle uh, agreed upon. Mutafiqun alayhi. In this hadith, the hadith uh, uh, regarding Aflah, uh, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, we learn uh, several benefits. One of the benefits of this hadith is that this hadith illustrates for us that we should not enter a person's house except for with their permission. 
So one of the important benefits we gain from this hadith is that we should not enter a person's house until when? Until they grant us permission. And that is uh, very important. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also uh, mentions that in the Quran that we should seek this uh, uh, permission in Surah Al-Nur. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was uh, very strong in her, her deen and her personality and that she uh, she only saw and wanted to follow the haq, follow the truth. And this is because she radiallahu ta'ala anha did not feel comfortable uh, with uh, Afla being in there and coming in and sitting with her and that and the, until the Prophet والسلام, clarified for her anha, that it was permissible that he was like her paternal uncle. Uh, it, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us the husn al-khulq or the excellent manners of the Prophet والسلام, uh, with his family and in general uh, and it shows how the Prophet ﷺ was very simple with his family. Uh, he wasn't, uh, you know, he answered their queries. He wasn't harsh with them. And he uh, entered upon them with happiness and showing joy and smiling and had beautiful, uh, beautified speech, ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَا مِنْ شَيْنْ أَثْقُلُوا فِي مِنْزَيْنَ مُؤْمِنْ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنْ حُسْنُ خُلْقِ the Prophet said, There isn't a thing which weighs heavier on the scale of the mu'min, of the believer, than good manners. And verily, Allah hates wicked and sinful speech. And so the Prophet exemplified those beautiful manners, the manners of the mu'min, which means it's his sunnah, and it's the sunnah that we must follow in, uh, and following the Messenger of Allah. And in fact, it's the sabila mu'mini. Because he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ma min shayin athkulu fi mizan al-mu'min. There isn't anything which weighs heavier on the scale of who? Of the mu'min. On the mu'min yawm al-qiyamah. Min husn al-khut. In good manners. So from the, ma from the uh, sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to have good manners. And this hadith illustrates for us the beautified manners of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with his family. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us that Aisha anha, was vigilant in gaining fiqh fi deen, in gaining uh, ilm, wa fiqh, knowledge, and understanding of her, her deen. And that's why she asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and she, she uh, expressed that she was uh, uncomfortable with that situation. And then when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, clarified for her, then she, she accepted that. And that's from fiqh fi deen, to accept the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, be vigilant in attaining the truth. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man yurad Allahu bi khayran yifakul fi deen. Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives him fiqh, gives him understanding of the deen. And may Allah bless us with fiqh fi deen. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Another benefit of this hadith is it also illustrates the excellent... Um, teaching of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that he uh, mentioned this hukum, this ruling with hikmah, with wisdom. And this was the way of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith shows us that uh, suckling and the tahrim that is attached to it, meaning the tahrim and nikah, uh, that it is uh, si similar to or takes the ruling similar to what would be uh, become permissible and impermissible through regular blood ties. So this suckling uh, makes what is normally uh, prohibited uh, permissible similar to the way uh, blood ties 
uh, the establishment of blood ties. So meaning that those rulings that are from suckling are the same rulings that blood ties. And, and as we mentioned uh, in the first hadith that we, we covered about those four things of, uh, of being able to travel and guardianship um, and the impermissibility of nikah, that all of those things are established uh, by suckling uh, similar to the way they are established by blood ties. In the next hadith, <clears throat> narrated Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, in what was sent down in the Quran was ten known sucklings made marriage unlawful. Afterwards, they were abrogated by five known ones. Then when Allah's Messenger وسلم, died, these words were among what was recited in the Quran, reported by Muslim. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, uh, وسلم, the hadith of Aisha anha, where she عنها, said, in what was sent down in the Quran was ten known sucklings made marriage unlawful. This uh, affirms for us that the uh, Quran was sent down, meaning that it was revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was revealed uh, from above the heavens by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, descending down upon his servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this uh, affirms for us the uh, revelation that the Quran is the revealed book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that the Quran is the kalam of Allah. It is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that kalam is from the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's from kalam or speech is from the characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses this characteristic of speech, tabarak wa ta'ala. And the Quran is from the speech of Allah, kalam Allah. Uh, also, this uh, hadith illustrates for us and affirms for us the nasakh that the some verses in the Quran uh, were abrogated and this is one of those ahadith which illustrate for us the abrogation and that along with uh, abrogation abrogation can be of two types it can be abrogation regarding the lev or ab abrogation regarding the hukum, meaning abrogation uh, to abrogate the actual, uh, the nus, the text itself where, uh, you know, the ayat that was, that, that is mentioned itself, the lev, or the lev, meaning the, the ayat may be still in the Quran, but yet the hukum, of that ayat may no longer may be abrogated by another hukum that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. And so this shows us that the abrogation uh, can come in two ways. It can be levdi or hukmi, you know, either related to an abrogation of the ruling or an abrogation of the actual uh, verse itself. Another uh, benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that uh, it is a con it is conditional to know the number of radaat uh, of uh, the sucklings in order to establish and affirm the hukum with regards to the tahrim uh, or the allowance of someone 
to be uh, to, to 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 fall under the ruling of being suckled by the woman and all the ahkam that we mentioned prior to this in the other ahadith regarding the uh, ahkam of rida'a. In the next hadith, uh, the 969th hadith, narrated Ibn Abbas, anhuma, the Prophet وسلم, was offered to marry the daughter of Hamza. He said, she is unlawful to me, for she is the daughter of my brother in suckling. And what is unlawful by reason of blood relationship is unlawful by reason of suckling relationship. Uh, this is in Bukhari and Muslim. So this hadith has um, uh, an, an additional benefit from it, which is that one must also bear in mind that an infant shall be related to his foster mother as well as her relatives. However, she will have no relation, uh, no relationship with the relatives of the infant. So that's very important. Hence the rulings the prohibition of marriage and the other ahkam that we mentioned prior to this uh, are applicable to the suckling child, uh, will not be applicable to his blood relatives. So it's very important that just because now there's new family tie, it doesn't make all the, the, blood, the blood ties uh, of kinship on each side, meaning from the side of the child or the side of the woman who has been suckled, that does not make those relatives now uh, having special ahkam with regards to uh, being the, the, um, the prohibition of marriage or the, uh, the other uh, ahkam we mentioned with, uh, regarding the uh, suckling. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, also uh, shows us the uh, the very strong love of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'een for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that was illustrated by the because uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was offered to marry the daughter of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhum. So that shows that they had a very strong love for the Prophet ﷺ because of course you don't give your daughter away in marriage to someone uh, who you do not care for. You do not have some sort of uh, affection for or that you believe that they believe them to be a righteous or a good person. Of course there are exceptions to this but this is the general ruling or the general way that people operate from our fitra that you want to give your your beloved daughter uh, and your relatives to those in marriage who you believe are suitable and who are good people. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the hikmah or the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he uh, illustrated the hukum or the ruling with regards to this and gave the reasoning behind it as far as his tahrim for being able to marry the daughter of Hamza radiallahu ta'ala uh, So the Prophet والسلام, gave the sabab, the reason for this and that is from his, his hikmah and his sharing uh, the wisdom, the hikmah and the ilm. This also, this hadith, it brings up the next point, which is the husna ta'neem of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This shows the, the excellence in the uh, teaching way and methodology of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that he also uh, gave the reasonings. Because often you find in, in a, an environment of ilm or... Uh, whether that be secular knowledge or Islamic knowledge, you find that people uh, people are inquisitive a lot of times. People are inquisitive and they want to know the reason why something is permissible, why something is not impermissible, or the reason behind the and the logic behind something, whatever the case may be, whatever the the science that a person is 
uh, studying. So this is from our inquisitive nature as human beings. And the Prophet والسلام, in his excellent form and me methodology of, of teaching uh, gave this bayan and this clarification to the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'anhum ajma'in wa sallallahu sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad in uh, the next uh, benefit of this hadith uh, this hadith also illustrates for us a very important qaida or principle and that is the uh, with regards to the tahrim or the uh, those things which rida'ah uh, by uh, suckling that which it um, uh, makes impermissible and and makes uh, what it makes lawful and this comes from the statement where the prophet والسلام, said وَيُحْرَمُ مِنَ الرَّضَاعَةِ مَا يُحْرَمُ مِنَ النَّسَبِ uh, that what is prohibited by rada'a or suckling is prohibited is the same which is that which is prohibited by uh, blood uh, blood kinship. So letting us know and that this is a qaida that that this is the asl and that this is what uh, that they uh, complement one another and the hukum is uh, is the same. In the next hadith, the 970th hadith uh, narrated Umm Salama radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the suckling that makes marriage unlawful is that which reaches the intestines, meaning nourishes the child, uh, and is taken before the two years time of weaning reported by a tirmidhi, and he and al-Hakam graded it as uh, sahih. Uh, this hadith uh, illustrates for us the uh, uh, it affirms for us the uh, that uh, rida or the suckling breastfeeding that it uh, that it does uh, make this uh, tahrim as we mentioned with the other ahadith in this chapter that uh, certain things are made lawful and certain things are made unlawful, like the marital kin, the marital ties, similar to the way, as we mentioned in the prior hadith, uh, as uh, kinship does. Uh, <clears throat> and in the uh, and and likewise, this hadith illustrates for us the uh, excellent uh, bayan or the way of clarifying that the Prophet ﷺ uh, gave to his companions which of course was a benefit for his Ummah. Uh, in the next hadith narrated uh, Ibn Abbas who narrated saying, suckling applies only to infants during the first two years of life, reported by Adar Qutni and Ibn Adi as Murfu, meaning a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam, and Mokuf, meaning a statement of a Sahaba, Radiallahu Ta'ala Majma'in. However, they both held that the stronger view is that it is Mokuf, the saying of a, a companion, meaning the saying of Ibn Abbas. This hadith also similar to the last hadith uh, uh, takes uh, illustrates the same rulings that we, we mentioned prior to this. Uh, and in the next hadith uh, narrated Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala in. Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the only suckling to be considered is that which gives life to the bones and causes the flesh to grow. In this uh, narration here, the narration of uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala it also, uh, this is a hadith that was uh, narrated in uh, uh, Abu Dawood 
and that uh, Hafez mentioned that there was uh, in this Isnad, the chariot of narrators, there was uh, those who were Majhul, meaning unknown. So this hadith uh, is uh, a weak uh, hadith for that reason. Uh, in the next uh, hadith, which means there's no need for us to go into, uh, you know, no hukum attached to that. Uh, narrated Uqba ibn al-Hadith radiyallahu ta'ala he married Um Yahya radiyallahu ta'ala daughter of Abu Ihab and a woman came and said I have suckled both of you so he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he replied how can you hesitate while it has been said that you are foster brothers and sisters Uqba therefore separated from her and she married another husband Al-Bukhari reported it. Uh, this hadith uh, illustrates for us a, a very important hukum, and that is that if a person marries someone who is uh, impermissible for them, meaning uh, impermissible due to rida'a, due to uh, the suckling, due to breastfeeding, then this Hukum takes the same ruling as we mentioned in the prior ahadith of the one who is uh, who are blood ties, so they're unlawful for one another. So it makes it uh, this hook this uh, hadith clarifies for us that they must be split, that their marriage they must uh, have firaq, that they uh, it's an obligation to uh, split them up. Uh, because of this 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 tie of kinship another benefit of this hadith is this hadith illustrates for us that when and this is a principle of uh, the muhaddithin that when that it is not a condition to ask about the status as far as trustworthiness of someone if that trustworthiness is already known. For example, if someone is known to be a person who is trustworthy, uh, then it is not necessary to ask about that individual because it's already known that this person is a trustworthy person who you can take knowledge from or uh, etc. And likewise, the case is the opposite, that if someone is uh, known for their sinfulness, that it doesn't require that you ask about them uh, with regards to uh, whatever they're bringing, in that it's already known their adala that they are uh, that they have um, uh, sinfulness, that they are a sinful person that is untrustworthy with regards to whatever the matter is at hand that is being asked about or that uh, needs to be known or the news that they're bringing. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us the uh, acceptance of a single testimony, uh, a testimony from a from from just one woman uh, when it comes to the issue of rida, because uh, in the hadith illustrated that uh, uh, that that a woman she came. And, and, I, and it was known that the woman was a trustworthy woman, obviously. And she said, I have suckled you both. So she came with this news. It wasn't necessary that she had to bring witnesses or that uh, there was anything else necessary to investigate as far as her, uh, her trustworthiness, but it, rather it was accepted. And this was illustrated because the Prophet Ali <coughs> uh, made... Um, clarified and adjudicated that they should be separated. And in the uh, the next hadith, the 974th hadith, which is the last hadith of this um, of this chapter, the chapter of Rida'a, uh, narrated Ziyad as uh, as Sahmi, radiyallahu ta'ala, and he said, Allah's messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Forbade that a stupid woman may be asked to suckle an infant. Abu Dawood reported it. 
it is more so missing link after the Tabi'i, and Ziyad is not a Sahabi. So, uh, this uh, hadith uh, is uh, Mursul, and it uh, this hadith is not, uh, there's not a hukum attached to it due to its uh, due to its weakness. And as Ziyad uh, Sahmi was not a Sahaba, was not a Sahabi. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them all. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in.